Today in this hyper-connected and hyper-competitive world of ours there are more conflicting opinions than ever before, not excluding sports science. It could be a matter of functional training versus compound lifts or the keto diet or carnivore diet, vegan diet, high intensity interval training or steady state endurance training, barefoot running, the list goes on. So with all of this noise and opinions and assumptions and conflicting information, how can we separate this from this? Now what is regarded as a fact or truth is a whole nother philosophical debate, we're not gonna go into that right now. But to simplify the complex, it can boil down to this. Some things in life, they are easy to test and easy to prove. We know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level. No matter how much you wish it didn't, it does. We know that gravity pulls objects toward Earth. No matter how much you wish it didn't, it does, because we have gravitation. With the current scientific knowledge that we have, these things are regarded as truths. And then we have things that are difficult to test and difficult to prove. And those include things such as consciousness, you know, the unconscious, psychology. And this is because they have so many different entry points, so many variables. It's such high complexity and so many cogwheels, so to speak, that it's difficult to quantify in one single mathematical formula. For example, we might test that someone, when they feel pleasure or when they feel happiness or whatever the case might be, they have a spike of dopamine, a biochemical in the body. But that is just a chemical reaction. How do we explain happiness in the first place or the sensation of happiness? Where does it come from, from a more metaphysical perspective, so to speak? Those are the kind of things that fall under this category. And all of this brings us to the scientific method, perhaps the best way of verifying information to date. Is it foolproof? Is it always fault-free? Absolutely not, but it's the best method we have right now. Let's go through each of its components. So everything starts with an observation. Just like Sir Isaac Newton observed the apple falling down from the tree, we as sports people might observe athletes who take creatine, they appear to be more powerful and explosive to athletes who do not despite engaging in the same training regimen. This is an observation, and it could have millions of factors we don't know, and that is the point. We want to find out. And this leads us to researching the topic. What is known currently about the topic of creatine? Well, the knowledge on the body's energy systems might state that the most powerful energy system, the phosphogen system, uses creatine as fuel. So when you're sprinting 100 meter, when you're doing a max effort lift or jumping as high as you can, this is the system that is used. And this system uses creatine as fuel. And naturally, this begs the question or the hypothesis which comes down to a bold guess. Does creatine supplementation increase power production? We don't know, but let's find out. And the best way to find out is through experimentation. And this might lead us to recruiting some elite athletes for the study. And one of the group gets creatine supplementation and the other one gets a placebo, which means that they think it's creatine, but it's not. So one group gets the real deal and one group gets the fake one unknowingly. And we establish some criteria to avoid skewed results. For example, we randomize the group. We don't cherry pick the people. And then we analyze the data, and lo and behold, the creatine group showed statistically higher power level after six weeks of training with creatine. And then we have to report our conclusions. What do we conclude out of such a study? And we might say that the results, they suggest that creatine supplementation indeed leads to significant improvements in muscle strength and power amongst elite athletes. But wait... If what you heard made you suspicious, well, you are correct, because there are some limitations with the study. First of all, they didn't mention it. There might have been tremendous differences in individual characteristics like training history and diet and body composition and all of those things. This might have skewed the results. And what about the sample size? It was relatively low. It was just 10 athletes. It might as well have been just a result of randomness, the results they came across. And out of those 10 people that participated in the study, who were then divided into two groups, two of them dropped out after one week, so this really diluted the results. And then we have to talk about the length of the study, just six weeks, this is a very short time span. What does that really tell us? Things such as power production and effort and motor unit recruitments, it's very volatile depending on how well you slept, what you ate, and a bunch of lifestyle factors. It's not really that reliable, just six weeks. 
And finally, the testing modality was the deadlift, which is a notoriously technically demanding movement. The competency in this particular group is not very reliable. We don't know which athlete was competent in the deadlift and which athlete was not. Perhaps a more simple movement in one monotonous movement pattern would be more appropriate. And this is why science is so good, because it allows for replicability, which means that everything is transparent, you can read the methodology and you can improve the study with improved parameters. If I make a YouTube video and just give you information out of my behind, so to speak, I can't really show you the methodology that I use as clearly as I can in a scientific study. This is why science is so good, because you can improve upon the past factors. So let's talk about this first creatine study that we just went through. It gives us a general picture, but there are too many flaws to draw strong conclusions. We can see the outline, so to speak, of the, quote, truth, but it's too early to draw any conclusions. And then comes a second study based on that that improves some of those factors. Like, let's say instead of six weeks, they did 12 weeks. They randomized better. They used athletically established athletes so they didn't get this, like, novice boost and all of that. So now we see a bit clearer picture. The outlook is a bit more clarified. But it's still not 100% convincing, but it's much better than before. And then comes a third study that improves upon study 2 by some other scientists with new circumstances, very good test equipment, let's say 30 weeks, a broad selection of participants, let's say thousands of athletes, whatever the case might be, and it still showed positive results, and it can only get better from here. Now we have a much clearer picture. I don't know yet if we can conclude that creatine works, but the outlook is much clearer. And this is the point of science. Whether there exists such a thing as absolute truth or absolute fact, that is debatable, but with science, with testing and retesting, we can at least get as close to that as possible. So now if you search creatine supplementation on Google Scholar, you will come across hundreds if not thousands of studies that have tested and retested all of the past findings, so... The outlook, the consensus on creatine looks pretty positive. And that is quite simply because it is rigorously researched with a lot of science, a lot of studies with different parameters, so all of the ifs and buts, a lot of them have been addressed so we can relatively safely consume it and go with the confidence that it will indeed increase our strength and power production. And that leads to us allowing it to be sold in society, for example. That is how scientific methodology works in a nutshell in the context of sports science.